Hi, it's Cayman Reynolds. Welcome to tonight's live chat. I'm running a couple minutes behind, and there's already some interesting comments, and some of them are fairly close to the truth. Dave Dwyer, Cayman still in the shower, been working the yard all day. <laughs> we just uh, literally five minutes till I walked into the door, um, we, we dropped about, I don't know, 2,000, 2,500 pounds of honey in the honey house, and I just jumped through a cold shower and... Here we are. So anyways, uh, I'm just that predictable. Uh, but it was a good day in the bee yard. We still have a little bit of a flow going, which is great. Um, it's not super strong, but it is something going on. And so I was able to pull honey supers today and did not have to worry at all about uh, robbing. The bees just got out of the way, used a little bit of a fume board and uh, a DeWalt bee blower, and it was great. So Bee Well says hi from us in New Zealand, first timer on the live, as the weather is terrible here at the moment as winter hits. Ah, so you guys are going through winter right now. Well, uh, thanks for jumping on. Um, I really have New Zealand on, pretty high on the totem pole of bucket list. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and so uh, the whole set they have over there in New Zealand, plus all the footage of the mountain ranges, it's a beautiful country from what I can tell. So thanks for hopping on. Bring us your big questions. Um, looking forward to lots of bee questions today. San Francisco, East Bernstein, Kentucky. We got everybody. Iowa, all right. A lot of you guys, evening from Scotland. So we have people from all over, and I hope you guys are having um, a, a good time. Let's see here. Hello from Sweden. Ah, yep, our Swedish friend. And uh, sorry, I'm kind of reading and thinking at the same time. And Whew, I'm, I've been wrung out today. I don't know how much sweat, but it's, it's a lot. Bearded Bee Works, that's uh, Mr. Uh, Hager, Josh Hager. It's, it's, see, I should know that. I'm just slow today, it's, so you guys have to bear with me. My jokes are going to be a little bit poor, I think. Still seeing some chestnut blooming here in North Georgia. Yeah, that stuff smells pretty strong. The, the pollen seems to be really good for the bees, but... Um, and I don't, the nectar probably is good, but I hate the smell of those things when they're blooming. It's nasty. Strapping down hives, high, high winds tonight in West Arkansas. Well, I hope they're good, Mark, but please blow us some rain towards this direction. We are dry here in central North Tennessee. DeWalt makes a bee blower. So they don't make a bee blower, but they make a battery-powered blower. It's their 60-volt series, and I purchased one. Because I already had DeWalt everything else. So I, I've really liked it. So basically what we did today is we went in and we had a couple fume boards going. We had three fume boards going. And we would go in and that would get 90% of the bees. If we were using something like butric acid, um, which is more of a commercial grade fume, we might not have to use the blower. But it, it, Gus Mitchell says it smells like cheese vomit. And he's absolutely correct. It's nasty. And so we use um, Honey Bandit, and it's more of a, well, it's like an almond oil, and it smells pretty good, but it does drive the bees out, but not quite as good. So depending on how much we use and how hot it is, because if it's not very hot, it doesn't push the bees down as effectively, then we'll, we'll have that bee blower as a backup and blow them right on out. And we'll just set it right in front of the hive and blow them um, out onto the grass in front of the hive, and it works really good, and I've never noticed any bees getting damaged by it because getting blown onto the grass is pretty par for the course if you're a honeybee. Hey, Cayman, since you extract honey one time in June, I believe, uh, what do you do with the extra honey frames in the fall since they continue to have a trickle flow and a fall flow? Hey, Cody, so we don't have much flow. If you know, I'd be shocked if I had seven more days. I'm a little surprised it's last this long, so... What we get over the next little bit here in June, they will consume that easily by early July because we take everything else. And for those of you who are wondering, well, what about all the honey that just came in the last day or two into the supers? Well, we're running a dehumidifier and some fans down in there, and we'll dry that on down just fine. And we have a, a, a refractometer. Well, I, actually, I have it right here. And we will use this and keep up with that. Now, as far as, so there won't be any trickle flow in July. There won't be any nectar flow at all in August. I've never seen a nectar flow in August here. 
but we will get a little bit of pollen in late August sometimes, depending on if we get good rainfall. But we will be feeding. I actually rigged up the, the feeding rig. Chris, was that the picture today for when everybody signed on? Okay, so uh, that was something we were working on this morning. And so I've already got syrup mixed up. When we pulled the honey supers off today, and it, it, was, it looked awesome, is uh, we, we pulled these bees all the way down to that single brood chamber, and there's just a beard of bees clustered on the outside. The fume boards pushed them out. And we put on that second box of foundation, pull up one frame, and I've got a two-gallon frame feeder, and we're just, we're prepping to feed them. But right now with the flow going on, there's, it's, there's no reason to, so I, we'll probably feed them sometime in the next five days or so. So I went ahead and threw some of the Hive Alive uh, Thymol product in there to uh, keep the syrup in good shape. Hey, Brian Reese. Hope you're doing good there in Jersey and the flow's going well for you. Really appreciate you starting the night off um, with a, a big donation. Appreciate that. Um, if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me and to uh, you know leave one down below. Tell uh, tell the boss that I said hello. <laughs> Question: Have you considered switching all of your deeps to medium boxes um, for, in your operation? I don't think so. I. I it's really frustrating um, doing a combo operation, as I'm sure you're aware, Harry. And the reason for that, for anyone who doesn't know, is because you have two different sizes of frames. The problem is we used to do nothing but deeps. When we started the YouTube channel, I think we were still extracting deeps. And we did not have any mediums at all in the operation. And we had it like that for several years, and we did this for a couple reasons. One, because anything could be anything. Um, if it was a honeycomb, we could throw it into a brood chamber, and now it's a brood comb. Obviously, an old brood comb that had been treated, we weren't going to use that for honey. But it gave us a lot of flexibility. Our extraction line, everything was the same. And it's cheaper to run all deeps because it's really not that much more expensive to buy a deep box and a medium box and not that much more expensive to get a deep frame or a deep foundation versus a you know medium. So it's, it's actually cheaper to build an operation off of deeps. The problem is it's going to be about 75 to 80 pounds per box and maybe more depending on the equipment that you're using. So that's a lot of weight. And doing one of them, it, you know, I actually still have a couple in service. I think I picked up four deep boxes of honey today. Boy, I don't like doing that anymore. I'm spoiled. And they definitely make you grunt. And doing a few of those isn't so bad, but it really adds up over time. Um, but going to mediums, the merits with that would be everything's lighter weight and you everything's the same. I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I think for someone who's looking to keep their operation fairly small, probably under you know 50 colonies, maybe all mediums make sense. The biggest problem with it is you have more frames to look through. So if you have to make a split um, and you know you're, you're having to find queen cells and you're, you're cutting those out it's, it's going to be a little bit more intensive with more frames but I've heard that you know some people just manage it more by the box and there's people very successful there's one operation that I'm aware of in Florida I don't know much about them but they do nothing but mediums and they run thousands of hives so obviously it'll work so great great bees are going to do well in that and it is an awesome thing. I truly miss having all my frames the same. Because when you're trying to draw comb right now, let's say you're wanting to get some honey supers drawn. And all of your stuff's deeps. Well, how do you pull a frame of larvae or something up there to bait them to start drawing that area? You can't if it's mediums. So anyways, I hope that answers your question. Um, that's one I'm pretty passionate about. But what do you do? Omaha, Nebraska. How do I emerge a queenless and a queen right hive when one has a honey super and it's 90 plus degree in Omaha? Well, if there's a flow going on, they usually merge fairly decent. And so this is a good time of the year to do it. Now, if there's a honey super on, that just means you're going to have to to pick it up and and set it back onto the colony. But what I would do is do a paper combined. So especially if the queenless colony is quite strong. So a paper combined, basically let's say there's a double deep 
on the colony with the queen, and then there's a, a honey super on top. Well, what I would do is take that honey super off, and then I would put that deep box or whatever it is that you're combining on. But between that, I put a piece of newspaper, just a single layer of it. And then you want to take like a, a little thin knife and just make some little slits. Not enough for a bee to get into, but enough they can get a handle on them and start chewing that. And then you want to put on that honey super on top. You can, you can shake those bees and the honey super onto the ground and let them go in the bottom. But they'll get through it within a couple of days. And one thing that you want to always do, especially if it's 90 degrees, is that lid. You need to be able to have some ventilation up there because if that newspaper seals it off and before they're able to get through, they run out of air, then you've killed those bees up top. So just um, you could take literally some toothpicks or whatever and just get a slit of air. Not enough where the bees can get out, but make sure that, that there's air up there and they can... Um, then they'll just slowly combine together, especially during a flow, and boom, you've done it. Trying to read my sweat cover notes from today. How do you keep track of your hive work and inspections? Well, one, we, um, we, keep, we, we get into them about once a week, so that, that helps a lot. But also, when we go into a, a yard, we try to keep most things uniform and most of them are in the colony the yard that I was in today there was 40 colonies in that yard and I would say probably 32 to 34 of them are very very similar in strength similar in needs very similar there's always a few outliers and eh, it's annoying but those are the ones that get attention and we will take duct tape and well not duct tape duct tape's tape doesn't seem to do the job anymore um, we use a t-rex tape or gorilla tape and that sticks to the lids pretty good the t-rex tape works better in my opinion than the gorilla tape for sticking to the lids and we'll put that down and i always have some pins that we mark queens with and or a sharpie and we'll write that on the lid if it's something that like we have to bring something from another yard then i will write a note down and take that with me on a piece of paper but if it's something that we can handle within the yard, then um, I'll just write a note like, we dropped a queen cell in this one on this, this, and date, so we know not to check it until we've given it enough time for that queen to come back. Or this one needs a mite treatment, or there's this one has no queen, or, or whatever. We could probably be a little bit more detailed, but we just kind of focus on, we really focus on the champs and not our wimps too much, and sometimes... You know, we lose a colony. I had one that tried to swarm on me early this year. So I took the queen and made a split with it. And I let the bees stay in there with some cells and try to requeen themselves. And they did not. They didn't, they didn't swarm, but they didn't requeen themselves. That colony today, um, I was in there and it was completely queenless and didn't have a lot of bees. I was in a hive that was wanting to swarm. Even on this late flow, I didn't give them enough space. And I gave them a couple cells and a, a frame of brood, and, and there's a good chance that we'll fix that one. So, you know, we just, we're always messing around, and sometimes things work out. That didn't really answer your question, did it? My mind blown seeing some locusts that didn't bloom in spring bloom this week in Etheridge, Tennessee. There's been some late weird stuff going on with, with certain crops. I don't know exactly what's going on. I don't see a lot of it blooming, but. Uh, right now, I don't see any black locust, but I, I did see some a few weeks ago. It wasn't a lot, but it was a little bit, and it was kind of weird. So um, this every year is quite a bit different, and uh, I, I, I really can't make any sense of this sometimes. Um, but, oh, Johnson's Liquid Gold. I like the, I like the name of that. Hey, Cayman, thanks for the great channel. Cookville, Tennessee. Okay, so you're, you're right next door. Johnson's Liquid Gold. I wonder if I've run into you. It's a good name. Um, don't be competing with me, though. <laughs> I'm just messing. So getting getting back to the flow that's going on right now. This is something I'm exciting about, excited about, and I hope that I'll be able to share with you in a video. I just need to get the work done. But this flow that comes in, it's always the last flow of the year. It is extremely strong. I mean, we can smell this nectar from 30 to 40 feet away very easily and this happens every year and whenever we smell that we know that's the end of the flow for us 
And so first of all, I want to know what is doing that because can I plant more of it? And secondly, I'm just a curious guy and I'd love to be able to know um, what is going into that late honey. So I have a really strong colony that right at the start of it, we were able to give some uh, combs to that did not have anything in it. And so put that right above the excluder and they're filling that up and even if they only fill two frames worth of honey in it i'll extract that off to the side and i'm going to send that off to the labs and i'm real i'm really excited to see what that is so i'll know and I'll, I'll do that in a youtube video and you guys can see and maybe you'll you have the same thing too but it's it's really strong there's a lot of nectars that you know if you open up the lid you can smell the hive ripening it up and it's really nice but this stuff i mean the whole yard smells like it. it's kind of like when goldenrod hits you know it ah hey melissa sorry you're having a bad time with uh, you got slimed out with three boxes full of honey has been in the freezer for the last four days what can i do with it now will the bees rob it if i put it out can i melt down the wax i don't know how bad it's slimed out melissa um, if it's just completely covered and nasty um, it's a little bit different than if it's got a little bit on it and it's really repulsive to honeybees because of just the way that it is, I suppose. But if it's just a thin little layer and you just literally take a little bit of a backpack sprayer or just a little water and, and get that layer off, the bees typically rob it really good. Um, I have an email. I, I have a very hard time getting to all of them, but if you'd like to send me some pictures of those full boxes of honey or just you know some of the frames just kind of a general idea of what they on average they look like and show me some of maybe a few of the best ones and a few of the worst ones too it would it would really enable me to be able to give you an accurate idea of what you could do with those and you know who knows small hive beetles uh, slime might be a health thing you know it might be something i don't think it'll catch on but you know all kinds of proteins and yeast and eh, fecal matter ah. Hope the bees should rob it out if it's not too bad eric gunter question when you feed bees do you have to feed every hive in the yard have been told if you feed one hive you have to feed them all well i've been doing it wrong for a long time if that's the case because uh there's some hives that just don't need it and there's some hives that need quite a bit and we take it on a per case basis so not all hives are the same and especially when you have 40 colonies there can be quite a few variables um we again we try to keep them as uniform as possible but there's a few of the hives in that yard of 40 that i just never got around to condensing down to a single probably three or four of them and so they have double deeps so they really don't need a lot of feeding because we left more honey on them because they had brood combs and you know we're not extracting from those so they're not going to need very much feed in comparison to the others. Um, the main thing is keeping the colony strong. I think the, the main concern is if you get robbing started, try to, you know, if you feed them all, some people think that that will discourage robbing. I, I think that's fiddlesticks um, because if you feed them all and robbing starts or if you only feed the, the weak ones that need feed, they're going to hammer those but if you feed all of them they're still going to hammer the weak ones anyways you, you might get more robbing going on it might be even more aggressive so there are some robbing screens that you can build yourself basically what it forces the bees to do is have to the bees from the hive have to go out and climb up the box about four or five inches and then take off and it's got a screen out front so that the robbing bees go and they smell that and they 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 don't learn to go over the top of it and they hit that screen and can't figure out how to go into the hive and this can really keep the ventilation good for a, a colony and you can protect your bees a little bit if you feel like you need to we actually don't use those and again we just try to focus on keeping all of our hives uniform it's really difficult for people who don't have as much experience and this used to be me for sure um but we'll go into colonies like, wow, these three are ripped. 
this these two over here are a little weak we'll pull a frame of brood pull a frame of brood and get those colonies we'll equalize any time of the year that we can to try to bring up the strength of the entire yard to be equal and it makes it to where if robbing does start they're all relatively strong and and we're always making splits i'm actually grafting queens right now and making splits so hope to make a lot more splits so you know it's some colonies just don't work out and we we expect it ah the age-old question ted jackson how can i remove pollen from combs i have about a dozen deep frames of pollen and would like to clean them out no clue i mean there are some guys in hawaii that do this they have a special way of soaking them long enough to get them soft and then like sloshing them around and loosening it and kind of getting them out that a ways but i don't know how effective it is it definitely is going to take a lot of time and if the the bee bread in the combs is still good those could be really nice in a dearth later but i know you probably want them for making splits and brew now but i have no answers for you as far as how to do that technically um Every method that I know is it usually damages the comb or ruins the comb. And um, maybe next time I talk to Zach um, in Hawaii, he can fill me in a little bit more on the process, and I can share that with you guys. I'm I'm very unfamiliar with that process. I wish we could get a little bit more pollen right now, but um, you know, maybe if your bees are in good shape, maybe you can get them some to draw some combs out or something. But yeah, I, I really. Don't know a method for that. So Mike says, out of the gate, please sting the like button, folks. Folks, So, um, yeah, sting that like button. All that stuff. Share it to your friends. Even people that hate bees. Do it. Um, Drew Jober. Hope I get that right. Hey, is there a good way to combine a full five-frame nuke into a two-deep colony that swarmed like two weeks ago and not doesn't have many bees? All are really healthy looking. We'll double check if you haven't recently that they don't have a queen in that one because sometimes you end up with a virgin that takes a long time and, and it and it happens. Um, they swarm and, and it can take a while for them to requeen properly. But yeah, you can combine a full five frame nuke into a 2D colony, no problem. Use the method I described before. Newspaper combine is best. You want, especially if you're, if it's equal, you have like a five frame nuke going into a five frame or even stronger amount of bees, then definitely a newspaper combine because it just, it takes a little bit more time. If there's not a honey flow going on, so there's not any nectar coming into the colonies, um, give them a little bit of thin syrup. You can, um, the colony that's on top, just put an inverted jar or something like that. Um, and let them feed that. Don't don't do a frame feeder in a, a situation like this. Um, just let that trickle feed come through a jar or a bucket or something like that. And what that really does is as they go through the newspaper, they have their bellies full of syrup, and when they meet those other bees below, they like those bees quite a bit because they have resources. If there's a nectar flow going on, probably not necessary at all. Hey Dave, um, I have a queen that's a real bricklayer. Lots of bees in the hive, but they're not storing honey. I don't understand how to get them to gather and store honey. Any ideas? Well, if she's a bricklayer, um, chances are if there was a strong honey flow, they would do it. Uh, maybe you have other colonies that um, are, are doing a little bit more, but a frame, uh, supposedly a, fr a frame of brood will consume a frame of honey and a frame of pollen in order to be get from point a to point b so that's a lot of resources right there so she's got six frames then that's you know six frames of nectar probably and and almost that much pollen too it's a lot of resources to make bees so they're probably burning it really fast and you also have to consider how long has she been doing this has she been doing it for months so she has a lot of forager bees if she's kind of young and and there's a lot of turnaround going she probably does she might have a good brood nest with a lot of young bees but she might not have a lot of forager bees so even if there's a lot of stuff out in the field 
she does they don't have enough forager bees to be able to really capitalize and that's one of the reasons why you have to have your bees ready for the honey flow before the honey flow you, you can't have you can have a strong colony but if it's not old bees and it's just young bees that really need about another 10 to 2 weeks you know before they have a strong foraging force you might miss a super of honey you know so uh, that's probably where it's at where you just don't have a flow so you know if you're not trying to get honey right now um, give them a little bit of feed let them draw some comb uh, good brick layers are really good at drawing out new wax I bought a nuke a month ago and they have both sac brood and I believe very possibly European fowl brood the man I purchased them from said he'd buy us two new queens would requeening work to fix it maybe so the problem is, is there some things that look like European fowl brood and they're not? Um, it could very well be fowl brood. But many times these days when people look at fowl brood and they don't know exactly for sure if it is because it looks very similar, what they're looking at is virus damage. And viruses can cause brood to look like it's European fowl brood. And if that's the case then requeening it can fix it for a time but if there's a lot of viruses in the colony then it can transmit eventually to that queen so what i would be very curious simon to see is is there a lot of mites in that colony and that is a, a pretty decent possibility I, a lot of times when i see sack brood and i see stuff that looks like foul brood um, i'm thinking mites now it could be not that but that's the first thing i check when i see something like that what is the mite load and if it is the mites then it doesn't matter what kind of queen you put in there it's, it's just not going to perform well the queen you have in there might be a decent one or was but if there's in a nucleus colony 800 to a thousand mites in there it's it's going to be a problem all right quick response i checked for mites both washed zero so yes, um, this would be a maybe the best thing to do, and this is rough, especially if the nukes aren't super strong. Hopefully they are. Is a brood break. So if you're getting the queen soon, maybe cage the queen. If you can catch the the one that's in the nukes, is cage her and let that brood break start happening. If you have access to any. Um, let's say essential oil product. Maybe you have some Pro Health from Man Lake, or maybe you have some Hive Alive with the Thymol. That'll help clean that out. Even just fresh syrup helps clean some of that out. You don't want to backfill everything, so maybe give them the opportunity to draw some new combs if they need to um, fill out some space. But a brood break can really help with that and just clean out and get that out of the bee system. And so when you get that new queen in there, they're, they're quite clean. Um, what I've done in these situations before, and it's really difficult if you have you know a weak colony. If there's only like three or four frames in that nuke, it's a different situation than if it's like at this point, you know, grown in your boxes and it's six or seven frames and you have, you know, a decent population of bees to work with. And what I've done in the past, if I've seen something like that, you can just shake all those bees onto foundation get rid of the brood it's a, it's a little bit of sacrifice but just shake them on foundation then let go ahead and let the queen lay don't cage her in that situation and feed 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 and that really cleans it out of their system because european fowl brood and a lot of those things are in their food and this european fowl brood can definitely be in honey so if you basically get rid of all of that then the only thing that's left is in their guts and then the adult bees it doesn't affect them they can transmit it, but it doesn't affect them. They can consume that, and it burns it out of basically the hive. So um, keep me posted, Simon. I'd be very interested to see how this um, develops for you, and, and best of luck. Bandit. Came in thoughts on dealing with carpenter ants. Second year beekeeper created my first split. Queen just started laying and went out today, and the ants are raiding it. Ooh, so they're actually raiding it. Well, a couple things that you can do is if your stands allow this, you can get tangle foot and put that at the base of your stands. Um, the ants do not like to cross that. Uh, there are some 
ant bait stations that you can put out there. Some people are really opposed to any type of insecticide, even within 10 miles of their hives. Um, carefully used, I have no problem with. I think a lot of those are Fipronel anyways. And really, you know, unless the bees act, actually consume it, it's not a problem. And so if you can, you know, find out what this nest is near your hive and um, drop a little hurt, um, that's one way to deal with it. Um, but if you can create some type of a moat or tangle foot um, barrier around the base of the hives, that will eliminate um, that if they can't get up there. When you want to requeen a hive, do you find it better to put a cell in the hive with the original queen or pinch the old queen? Um, typically, if I want to play it safe, I'll take the old queen and put her in a nuke with some of the bees from that hive. And so if the cell doesn't work out, I still have a queen. You know, if she's no good, then there's no point in doing that. If, but if she's like, this queen still is pretty good, she's, she's more than mediocre, then you know, make a split with her and then drop your queen in. But you could, if you had enough cells, just then make two splits and drop a cell in each and double your chances. So typically, if when we requeen a hive, we, we do go ahead and um, get rid of her. But we don't. We will make a split, typically. We will you double screen board, whatever. I like to double my chances or triple my chances. And that way, even if I get a 50% take, which is not very good, I still don't go backwards. And man, fresh queens from a cell that go out like that. Oh, I've had some come back here recently, and it's hard to beat, hard to beat. No problem, Bandit. Keep me posted. Cayman, have you seen bees trying to supersede a young queen? I had a slow, I had one slow to start laying well. They tried to remove her, and I kept smashing cells until she started laying bricks. They're happy now. Absolutely. This happens to a lot of people. It happens to me. And bees, we have this illusion in beekeeping that bees always do it right. Get rid of that I, that idea or that illusion. Bees don't always do it right. Not all bees are created equal, and bees get in bad situations and sometimes make poor decisions. Bees don't sit down and have, you know, they don't sit there and just think about the situation rationally. They are a, basically a slave to their programming, and they have stimuli. So if the colony is way out of balance, and you introduce a new queen to them. It could be one of your own. It could be one you purchased from Bob Benny, and Bob raises good queens, don't you, Bob? And, you know, you can put that in there, and it could be an awesome queen. I've done this. You take them out of a colony, and she's just laying bricks. You put them into this, these bees that are thankless, that are out of balance, and they'll try to supersede her. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll let her lay two or three frames, and then they'll try to supersede her off of her young brood because they think something's wrong with her because that colony is so out of balance. And a lot of times the when you ma you introduce these queens to a hive that's completely broodless or, or close to broodless, and they're all old bees. Nurse bees, it's, it's kind of a different situation to a degree. But if they're really out of balance, they'll take it out on a good queen, poor queen. It doesn't matter. And like you said, sometimes you can just smash those supersedure cells, and and let and then they'll they'll after her brood emerges and they kind of go with it, they're fine. Things are balanced out. And then sometimes they were right, and that queen did suck. And and I've had this before where a queen will lay good for about a month and a half, and then she'll just start laying drones. She didn't get mated properly. It's hard to tell. What do you do? You know, but uh, at the same time, you got to realize the bees sometimes will make a knee-jerk reaction decision, and they'll kill a good queen for no good reason. Brad Witt White. I'm going to... Someone needs to educate me on that last name. I had a terrible result for my... Sp Spring splits using swarm cells. Five out of 20 resulted in either a lane worker or a port 
5 out of 20 results in either a lane worker or a poorly mated queen. I've never had this bad of results. Any ideas why? It could be weather. Um, so it sounds like you got a 75% um, success rate, if I'm reading that correctly, which isn't too bad depending on the weather. If the weather is poor and they can't fly good, or if it's really early in the season and you know, maybe there's there should be plenty of drones, but sometimes things happen. I have literally had in the same yard in two different rounds. One, I missed one out of 24, and the one prior to that, I had the same amount, and I didn't even get 60%. It was a terrible take. And so I had like 90-something out of one, and, and then the same location, same graph, same everything totally different results so uh, weather and timing uh, there's something to that but um yeah i've probably dealt with in my mating nukes mm, 15 lane worker situations minimum probably 20 and you just have to get back there uh, promptly um, whenever you have cap cells write the date down get online look at how many days until you should have emergence and then you'll get and then you should have a lane queen and then give it a couple more days give it an extra four or five days and they're not going to be lane worker in, at that time and then you come back and if there's a lane queen you're good and if not then you combine them back and you don't ever get in a lane worker situation but you know you always get behind this time of the year and things happen all right Catherine came and thank you. My drone laying hive has been laying drones for about a month. I'm in Northern California. I fear they could be strong in their preference. Is it better if I just shake them? Yeah, probably so. Um, they get old and they, they get kind of hard to, to fix. Um, do you, If you have some other hives, Catherine, um, that's where you could uh, shake them out and give them some young brood from, you know, young uh, fertilized brood that's uncapped and that really helps get rid of that what really retards lane worker um, situations is brood pheromone and if it's a drone lane hive um hmm. so i guess i gotta ask a question maybe i'm reading this wrong my drone lane hive is this one that you purposely had to lay drones to for mating or is this one where you've had a queen go drone layer like the video i posted today um either way if it if you're trying to get it to where you know on the second one where she's been laying drones throw in some young brood in there and then you can either purchase a queen or, or something like that or you can just shake them out and let them combine back with other bees as long as there's not a lot of robbing going on and there's not like a dearth of nectar usually they combine back fairly well um, if there's bees killed by the colonies they try to go into, it's usually the lane workers. They don't like to accept those. Um, drone lane hive. So I guess it, it really depends on if it's a queen that's laying drones or is it lane workers. All right. Let's see. Whoa. So here's one by Shane Williams. Hey, Shane. Um, man, I'm sorry to hear that. You've developed a bad allergy to bees. I'm having to leave the hobby. Can I still participate on our channel? Well, of course you can. Um, we, we let all kinds of people on here. Um, even, even my brother um, comes in every now and then. But I hate to hear that. Um, I have heard that some people will develop an allergy long term, and I've heard that some people just have a, a bad reaction for a little while, and it goes away, and then... Um, some people it stays with them, and there's there are some therapies for it. I know that Ian Stepler's wife had really bad reactions and was allergic, and they they did some um, stuff with some of the doctors up there, and she's able to get out in the bee yard now. So I don't know any details on how expensive that is or how long that takes, and it probably depends on the individual. But I really hate to hear that, Shane. That would be a huge huge uh i don't know what i would do i might just i don't know i just i don't, I don't know what i'd do what laurel you're looking over there funny at me oh i'm let me scroll down i'm not i don't see anything what's with this is this on my phone 
on this thing. I don't see anything from you on here, Laurel. Huh? I can't see anything from Laurel on here. Uh, Chris, is there anything from Laurel in the, the chat group? Oh, I can't see it on my end, Laurel. Laurel was sending me hearts and stuff on the live chat because I'm such a stud. And oh, oh, you're trying out a new feature. You're just testing it out. That's what that was. Okay. Uh, sorry about the inter interruption, everybody. But you know, when it's the the uh, the the boss, you just have to drop everything. I love you, Laurel. What? <laughs> well guys it was nice knowing you all do you have a video on fixing a lane worker hive jason powell i'm not 100 percent sure um, you know we've released 500 and something videos and it sounds like we have um i don't think i have that in a playlist though hmm i'll have to, I'll have to double check and if i do I'll, I'll i'll have that for the next live chat all right so I've missed a lot of questions, Chris. Um, after this one, if you have any, just feed them to me. Hey, Cayman, I extracted honey from my hives yesterday. The honey tastes very good, but has a strange, slightly bitter aftertaste. Do you have any ideas where this bitter aftertaste comes from? I really don't know. Um, what state are you in? And um, you know, are, are you in you know around Tennessee, or are you somewhere you know out west, or even out of country? Um, I guess that would be the question. Nectar can be extremely diverse, and our flows change here. Used to. Okay, let, let's see if I got it. So this honey has darkened over the years. This honey is four or five years old, and this is darkened a couple shades. This used to be quite light, especially in this tiny jar. And now we're getting honey that is like red amber almost. Um, I'm not sure I have a jar of that in here. But this year's honey looks quite dark. And so from one year to the next, even our flow will be different. There you go, Laurel. All right. Quit. Oh, Yvonne says that she sees the hearts, and it's so sweet. So thank you, Laurel. I, I really appreciate that. Cayman, thank you for all that you do for the beekeeping community. Much appreciated. Keep it coming. Hey, thanks. I really appreciate that, Josh, a lot. Um, you know, we're, we've got a lot of things in the works. I've been talking to a couple companies. I'm really excited about uh, what some of the companies are doing now. And um, there's, there's a lot of competition out there and exciting uh, small companies as well. Um, there's a – oh, sorry, are you going to do it again so I can see it, Laurel? Oh, they're sending stuff too. Well, everybody send me hearts. How's that sound? <laughs> and, and you got, I got a giggle out of that one. Um, Laurel's got it rigged up on my phone so I can see the aftermath of, of, of whatever you send me. Can they send me angry faces? Okay, yeah. That's good. No angry faces. I've been pulling honey all day. Cayman, are you coming to Mount View Arc? Arkansas um I don't th think so do I ha I don't think I have an Arkansas on the books um if if they have me on their schedule um let me know um yeah Brian Reese says he doesn't see anything I'm not seeing anything maybe it's all this new stuff hey central Virginia okay hmm never been to Virginia I don't think I don't really know hmm Hey, um, for those of you who guys who live there on the East Coast, I know that there's spotted lanternfly out there. Could it be some of that stuff, or is it too early in the season for that? It might be a little too early. And, and maybe they don't have it in Virginia. I know they have it in some of the eastern states. Okay, Catherine says, Queen was poorly mated. I tried to introduce a new queen, and they kept trying to sting her. I've been afraid they would kill a good queen with a paper combined. I don't know if you have another hive, Catherine, but if you do... Maybe it would be better to make um, a split with that um, right now. Again, when, when bees get really far gone, it can be difficult. What you could do is do a, a little bit of a, a different type of introduction. And they have these push-in cages. And 
you can let her get in there and, and lay for a little bit, but it's tricky. It's very difficult to requeen a hive that is far out of balance. It's not impossible, but it's difficult with a mated queen because a lot of times they get aggressive and they'll damage her feet. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll nibble on them and, and, or different things. And where a queen cell, if you had a queen cell, you know, you can drop that in and a lot of times a virgin will emerge and they feel like that's kind of theirs and, and they just, you know, and if you lose a queen cell, it's like, oh, well, bummer. You lose a $35, $40 queen and it's, ouch. All right. Are you coming to Mount View, Arkansas this year? Bring Bob with you if you come. I don't, I haven't been asked to. Is, I think that's the one I, I spoke at maybe last year. I have not heard anything about that. Um, I am going to Canada, um, though, this year. I'll be in, So anyone who's from Canada, um, now I know it's a big country, um, but I'll be in Calgary in late September, early October, and I'll be in Florida um, with the Palm Beach Beekeepers Association the first weekend. Um, no, yeah, the first weekend in September. So... I don't know why I keep booking so many of these things. Um, also, if you got anyone that's in the Illinois region, I will be in Illinois speaking a month from now with Randy McCaffrey, Natalie Summers, and Corey Stevens, and several other speakers. And you'll have Mr. Ed up there. And that, that looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. So that's going to be in Quince, Quincy, Illinois, the 15th, 14th, and 15th, I believe, of July. And that'll be fun. All right, Dan Weaver says, Lanternfly still in nymph mode. All right. Yeah, I don't know much about that. It'll probably be out here before we know it. Better not get on my fruit trees. Pappy's Bees, Middle Tennessee here. Nectar flow has been slow, and our bees are, or our bees are just lazy. Have only a few with capped frames out of 13 colonies. Is slow in your neck of the woods, Cayman? Um, no, um, not really. Um... You know, this hasn't been a year for the record books. It's kind of been average. This, um, we're we're pulling on a good colony though, three mediums of honey, and sometimes four. But if you know the ones we pull for, a lot of times if you condense it down, it'd be three solid boxes of, of honey. And in a good year, I'd like to get four. Um, so you know, we're looking at probably averaging out in the yard somewhere between probably 85 90 pounds on honey production colonies which isn't monstrously great it's a little below average but it's also not terrible either um, the flows early on it was just the weather didn't cooperate quite right and privet never showed up but we definitely have some hives that haven't done as well as others and um strong laying queen having drawn combs and and definitely mites and um, i had one yard that was a little high in mites this year and we hit them with formic acid early when it was cool and that really helped and it got a lot of those colonies to where they could produce um and i don't think they would have otherwise uh havan used to truck up to calgary that's that's a long drive we need to get you and Bob to Australia. Laurel really wants to go to Australia, so I'm I'm really prone to uh, that trip right there. But boy, what a long flight! That is a talk about some jet lag. Um, but that would be fun, I, especially if I was going down there during my off season. Um, I'd probably just spend a little bit more and, and make a vacation out of it, and uh, and go see and see what all the beekeepers are doing uh, down under. That would be fun. And any time I'm hanging around Bob, it's great because Bob kind of evens me out a little bit. I'm, I'm the guy that's bouncing off the walls, and, and Bob's just over there, Mr. Chill. Chris, that needs to be a T-shirt. Um, King Bob, Mr. Chill. Um, <laughs> Richard Marker came, and what can I use to kill grass under my electric fence around my bee yard? Well, there's a lot of different things you can use. Um, there's more natural stuff. There are also are some herbicides that are granular, so you're not like spraying something that can drift. So you can just kind of throw that out and do it like of an evening. Um, some people don't want to use anything unnatural like that. And that's all right. I know beekeepers who literally use herbicide um, around their yards, though. Um, I have two farmers that spray herbicide within... 50 feet of my hives every year 
and I know they're going to do it. It's it's in the it's just fence rows. It's not like they're doing all of it, and it kills everything. Weeds kills the grass. It kills everything. I've never noticed any problems with my bees. They're not foraging on that stuff, and you know I haven't seen any issues. Herbicides, unless you just spray it directly on a bee. Um, it kills so fast. If you if you use it in hot weather, the plant dies and starts weathering so quickly. And bees can pick up on that. They forage with um, frequencies off of the plant. So if the plant is looking pathetic, it's not something a bee is going to be getting on to. Um, so, you know, it doesn't seem to be a big problem. But for some people, it is a big problem. So, you know, or use a weed whacker. That's fun. All right. How do you you manage feeding sugar syrup during the dearth periods and prevent them from moving a bunch of stored sugar syrup into your supers when you put them on during the flow? So I don't have any more honey flows. So as I'm pulling these honey supers, and I, that's what I'm doing right now is pulling honey supers. And when I pull those off, I put on a box of foundation. I feed, feed, feed. And I won't pull any honey the rest of the year. And the fall flow gets put into those um, second deep boxes. And we're not putting on any honey supers right now, um, which is our medium boxes. Everything that we're putting on to get drawn out is deeps. So those will be, you know, brood combs. The queen's going to lay in it. And then, oh gosh, um, my train of thought just went... And then we'll just leave the doubles on all winter long, and they'll have a mixture of sugar syrup and goldenrod honey. The only time I'm concerned about sugar syrup going into my honey is feeding prior to the flow. And that is a dearth of sorts. Usually we have good pollens prior to the nectar flow, but we don't have any uh, sugar syrup. So we're really careful with that. And so what we do is usually there's like a pre-strong honey flow. You'll have like wild cherry... You'll have henbit and these little bitty plants that are producing a small amount of nectar at that point. And we split our hives at this point. So anything that we're suspicious in the brood nest that has a lot of syrup or honey or anything, that gets taken. The split gets that. We don't really want it with our honey production colony anyways. We want that queen to have a ton of brood rearing room. So we reduce them down to a single box. We give them drawn combs, and almost no honey is left at all in that bottom box. But there's a flow going on, so we can do that. So the timing is super critical. Um, And then the split that we make gets a queen cell, takes some frames of brood, and takes all of the food, and they're in good shape. And and so that's kind of how we do it. It's um it's the way we operate our bees is a lot more dialed in than a lot of people do it and a lot more than we used to do it but we get a lot more combs drawn this way our bees produce more honey this way and and i i'm not concerned at all about getting any honey with this method either hey richard no problem i've been using the weed whacker i'm about weed whacked out (laughs) i know that feeling actually laurel does she does a lot of the weed whacking I, I'm telling you right now, um, we've, we've been mowing around hives and stuff, and I, I hit a nest of chiggers, and I don't know. It's, I've got to have at least 60 to 70 on the low end. It, it is just miserable right now. I, I'm about ready to go scorched earth. I've got this flamethrower that hooks up to a propane tank, and I'm just fixing to go over there and just burn down all the brush around those beehives. I, those things have been driving me nuts. That and the ticks. I hate it. How do you protect your drawn comb from high beetles and wax moss after extraction before winter, especially if they have some bee bread in the comb? Well, if that is, you know, some, if it's like a super and we can't give it for brood combs, if it's got a lot of bee bread and it's a deep, we're definitely throw it into a hive because that helps them through the summer months. But bee bread's a difficult one. You're going to have to... you. You're going to need to put it in a freezer. You either need to give it to a hive or you're going to have to put moth crystals on it. So using something like paramoth crystals would be um, what you would do if you're okay with that or a freezer. If your spouse is okay with that. Um, as far as if they they don't have any resources in them, 
if it's put out, out in the open air pretty well, that's great. But really, if wax moth crystals is the safest way to deal with it, we don't use those hardly ever. But if I'm going to use them, it's because it's got bee bread in it. But if you keep them really well open and ventilated and keep the mice out of them, we have very, very little damage with that. But the conditions have to be right, and you have to have a good place to store them. And I've got a shed out here and access to another shed on my dad's place and one on a, a, a property we have bees on that I can store these things um, and get some daylight through there, get a lot of ventilation, but it takes a lot of work. So the Paramoth Crystals is definitely the easiest route unless you have a big freezer. Or a cold room. It doesn't have to be frozen, just something like below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 50s, 40s. That'd be awesome. So be well, honey says thymol crystals work good in winter stored boxes. I've never considered thymol crystals. I don't know how long they would last. Um, pro- maybe as long as the Paramoth ones would. And I would, if that worked and they were affordable, I would be a lot more comfortable with thymol versus the Paramoth. Something to look into. So sit in the hot water with Epsom salts. Hmm, maybe that, whatever it takes to get rid of these chiggers, I'm I'm about ready to try anything. I'll throw some salt over my shoulder, whatever it takes. Um, Jim Simpson, Simpson. Why bees fill my broods and not go to the supers? Are the supers drawn? If they're foundations, a lot of times... If it's a strong nectar flow, I mean, they, they can bring in 10 pounds, 15 pounds of nectar on a strong nectar flow, and that's going to go into the combs. And if you have foundations, then um, by the time they get those drawn, they've already backfilled for weeks. Chris, are you, do you send me something? Okay. I thought you were pointing at me. I'm just trying to make sure I'm I'm paying attention to everybody. Okay, I got you. So, but that that's the number one reason why people have backfilling is because the bees can take time to draw combs um, out, and the foundations um, maybe don't have a good coat. If they have a really good coat, bees do draw them faster. But this is again one of the problems that you have if if your supers are mediums and they're all foundations and your deep boxes are all, you know drawn out and that's what the queen's lane you can't pull a frame up and get them to bait them to draw it a lot faster it it takes a lot longer for bees to go up and do a whole box of foundation versus pulling up a frame of young larvae or eggs into it and it's just it's massively different and a good coat makes a a, quite a bit of difference too rainy anchor say says what's a chigger it is awful i mean i've got them all over my body um, and they burrow into your skin and it itches like a mosquito but you can run into a nest and there can be dozens of them basically it's um the spawn of the devil sherry luke how much sugar syrup will the bees move from the brood chamber up into your supers when they're making more room for the queen to lay well it could be a decent bit um, depends on how much you have down in there and you know how much room they have to clear. I mean, if there's four frames full of sugar syrup and now you've got combs up above and they clear out two of those for her to lay in, that's the thing, though. Are they moving it up or are they consuming it? It's, it's hard to know. Um, that's why you usually play it on the safe side. But... Um, you know, we don't leave a bunch like that, so it's a little tricky. There's some beekeepers, especially in their first year or two, they have they have young colonies, young swarms or whatever, and they feed them, rightly so, to get them to draw a lot of foundation out because you need combs. you got to get some combs. And you know, then you put your super on, the flow ends up being good, and then you end up getting some honey, and is there a little bit of sugar syrup moved up into there? It could be a small amount. But it's probably just a small amount. And even if it's a pound up there and 30 pounds of honey, you know, that's not something that you really want to sell. However, is it something that you'd want to eat? Well, why not? People drink 
Coca-Colas all the time, and it's not inverted by bees. And all kinds of stuff with high fructose corn syrup, that sugar syrup's better. So that what I would do in that case is I would eat it myself because it's the majority of it is honey. The bees have imparted things onto the sugar syrup if there is any. And I would give it as gifts. And then now you've got some combs and some people get their tail in a knot over that situation. I wouldn't sell it as pure honey. I just wouldn't sell it. Giving it away as gifts or using it myself, not a problem at all. It makes wonderful ice cream. Hey, Dave Dwyer, hope you're doing good. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, you were spot on with that comment earlier on. Yeah, you caught me red-handed taking that shower. Um, however, um, hope you're doing good with your new bees and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, Rainy Acres, it is awful. It's whatever, you know, ticks. Um, if you know what ticks are, it's it's kind of like that without the uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever or whatever it is. Ah, bow hunting. Yeah, you learn quick. Yeah, yeah. I need to, I need to get some stuff to spray around my ankles. I, Laurel keeps telling me to do it, and I just I don't. And then I get the I told you so. Um, let's see. So I need to get the recipe that Laurel makes um, for honey ice cream. It's absolutely awesome. If you have your own honey, and you got to make it right, you, you get you know good vanilla bean. Um, you add real cream. You use the heavy stuff. Don't water it down with two percent milk or anything like that. If you're going to sin, sin all the way. And when it comes to ice cream, if that's not part of your diet plan, and the honey is really good. Now, I will admit, not all honeys are good at this. I mean, if you have a really strong flavored dark honey. It might not be the best. Sometimes dark honeys are really delicious, though. But sometimes you get a dark honey that's really strong. It's It really kind of can overpower the vanilla flavor if that's what you're going for. So a good light honey is awesome, honey ice cream. I've got to do a video. Man, I am wanting some so bad right now. Anita Setter, thanks for coming back on, Anita. I'm trying to get my colonies queen right after my walkaway splits on May 16th. Today's inspection had some with cat brood and larvae. And some with cat brood and, and none is is a queen present. Well, hmm, May sixteenth. So we're a month out. There should not be any brood left over from the split. So a month out, that you know, it's a twenty-one day cycle. So how would they have capped brood in there? So. But you don't see any young stuff. That's an interesting situation. That's one I would come back to in a handful of days and see if something weird's going on. Or they they run out of room. Um, who knows? But definitely keep an eye out. Clear fingernail polish over a trigger bite works great. That's what my mom did to, to me as a kid, and I haven't done that as an adult. And maybe that would work. Um, I, I don't re remember it very much. Ivermectin was originally made to kill mites. Should work on chiggers too. Hmm. I'm gonna. Have to, I'm gonna if I, what happens if I try all these things at once, Chris? Do you think I'll make it? Boom. <laughs> That's right. Patty Hendrick. I harvested honey today and discovered a queenless colony. I did a. a I did see a supersedure cell. Many frames are dried. Does this sound like a colony was robbed and could make a comeback with a new queen? Hmm. You know, if there's a decent bee population, I would give it some time. You know, a decent population would be probably something four or five frames of bees minimum. Um, hopefully more than that. Just give them a little bit of time. Kind of, you know, if you have a super seizure cell that's capped. Let's see. It's capped. Let's say it's freshly capped. Four days. We'll come back 18, 20 days later. Light inspection, not a lot of smoke, and see what you got. And if you don't have anything, just shake them out and, you know. Chigger Rex is amazing. I'll have to look at that, Bonnie. I've never heard of that before. Chigger, Chigger Red, best stuff. I've never heard of this stuff before. Chris, I'm out of the loop. I don't. I only know bees. I don't know anything about chiggers, except they itch. Uh, Cayman, does rocket fuel help keep syrup from going bad? I'll be making it soon in bulk and putting it in a storage tank. I've read that people put a small amount of bleach into the syrup. Thoughts? 
Uh, great question. I don't think so. I'm um, talking to Andrew. Um, he doesn't put any preservatives in there, and um, I, I'm pretty confident it's not going it, – it may slow it down a little bit, but it's not going to be a lot. Um, sometimes when you add it certain ingredients because of the mineral composition, it can retard things naturally. But if it did, it would be like a day or two probably at best. Um, I want to count on it. Bleach could work, but it's kind of maybe counterproductive because could that bleach could that bleach damage some of the stuff in there? I don't know. Um, thymol could damage it as well, though. So that's the thing that you, you just don't know. Preferably, this is the way that I've got my system working is I try to make it to where I know I'm going to feed it within a couple days. Nothing added to it. Feed it fresh. And then... And, and I do frame feeders, so my bees take it down really fast. And then anything that I don't use, I put um, thymol in it through either Hive Alive or Man Lakes Pro Health that have thymol in them. And, and, I'll, and I'll put a good bit in there, actually quite a bit, um, maybe a little bit more than it w- it's recommended on the packet because I, I usually will save it a little bit longer, and it'll be outside in the sun. I, I can't put it in a cold environment. But... Then when I make more sugar syrup to feed, I'll just mix that in with that stuff, and it'll dilute that dip back down. So, um, but u- using the rocket fuel, I, I want to know. Um, I would email Andrew, um, see what he thinks about that. He he might know. Hey, Steve Amos, thanks for coming back on, and thanks for donating to our channel again. Have you noticed issues with different bee breeds robbing slash fighting more than all Italian or carnies? Um, I believe, based off of the eye test, that I get a little bit more robbing tendency with Italians versus carnies. I'm not super familiar with running Caucasians at all and haven't had Russians hardly at all. So I really couldn't compare anything besides carnies and Italians. Um, I think that the Italians are more prone to rob. And that could be because they are more prone to keep bigger populations too. So more carnies in a dearth period will want to grind, not to a halt, but they'll, they'll naturally slope off more than an Italian hive will. So that could be the reason why. But I like my carnies um, quite a bit more. Um, for the frugality, and I feel like the robbing is not quite as bad. But all bees, it kind of makes sense that you know any hive that's good at making honey is probably going to be halfway decent at robbing too. Um, you know they're just they're go getters and they want the good stuff. If you see anything different, Steve, though, let me know, please. Jumping in an ocean and staying a while will definitely kill chiggers. That sounds like a lot of fun. Unfortunately, the nearest beach to me, I think, is about 10 hours. Um, road trip. Um, who, who wants to go on a trip uh, to the beach? I, I, Chris says he's ready to go. Let's just have a, a nice big beekeeping like seminar on the Gulf. Um, there we go. Shrimp for everyone, unless you don't do that kind of stuff, and then you can have flounder or something like that. I'll eat the shrimp for you. Gosh, I'm hungry. This is killing me, man. I haven't had dinner yet. Uh, <laughs> planning to pull, honey. Uh, this is, um, yeah, from Nick. Thanks, Nick, so much. Appreciate you from coming back on. You're planning to pull, honey, and I'm short on boxes. How long can I leave a strong honey production hive in a single? Sorry, I'm cracking myself up here. So we've we've got a new phrase that we're saying now for somebody who's, um, you know, you, most beekeepers are awesome people. And I'll get to your question, Nick, I promise. Uh, most beekeepers are pretty awesome. But there's always a few beekeepers that are a little bit, you know, they're not quite, uh, you know, right in the head. And so our new phrase is like they're one frame short of a full box or something like that. And that just made me think of it. Uh, so that's that's one of the new things that we say around here. That, that's, and if they're really bad, they're two frames short of a whole box. Uh, anyways... So you're planning to pull your honey and you're short on boxes. How long can I leave a strong honey production hive in a single deep while I extract their honey? So, I mean, you can do it. If there's a honey flow going on, they're going to backfill like crazy if it's a strong one. But you don't have to worry about them starving. 
However, if um, there's no honey flow going on, I would not let it go longer than 24 hours. It's that's that's not even ideal in of itself. But you could put a little bit of feed on, like you could give them. Um, you know, put the feeder in and give them some feed until you can get the box on. But it really needs to happen pretty promptly. They'll go downhill within a couple of days if it's like two or three deeps worth of bees and they don't hardly have any food in that bottom deep. A lot of it depends on the bottom deep too. But most of the singles that I see this time of the year, you know, we're talking the best case scenario in that bottom deep, one deep frame of honey. And most of them don't even keep that. They just they are so good at pushing it above that excluder which gives us the the good honey yields even in a poor year. But um, I'm a little short on boxes too, and so we actually spent the other night um, getting some of these old beat-up boxes that we were planning on burning and actually using them. So they don't look good, but they're getting the job done. So sorry about that, Nick. Um, just uh, hurry up. Work, look, work harder. You know, get if you, maybe if you're married, you can get your wife to go do some bee stuff for you. Go pick up some more equipment. Good luck with that. Um, hey, Jack, first year beekeeping. We have caught six swarms. Put them in your yard. Three of them left within two days. What do I need to do to help prevent this from happening? All right. So this is somewhat common. Um, that seems like a little bit more. One thing that you can do to help swarms stick around is if you already have established hives, is you can give them young brood. Uh, that can lock them in more, giving them that young brood that has to be fed. They're more reluctant to do that. But swarms um, sometimes want to leave because if they're from that nearby f- vicinity, if they already, let's say it's one of your swarms. I, I, this doesn't sound like they were from your bees. But let's say it's here at my house and I have a hive swarm and they've been sitting there for several hours and they've already decided. They've they've gone around and they've found this cavity in this tree a quarter mile, half mile, mile away, whatever. And they've already reached a consensus that they're going in this tree. It doesn't matter if I grab them off of that limb and put them in a box. They're going to go. That's still in in their mind. So sometimes these things happen. Um, I there's other tricks giving them brood um, sealing them up for a day or two you just got to make sure they have ventilation you got to make sure they have food one thing that some people don't know is that swarms you see the bees flying around like there'll be a cluster but there's usually bees flying to the swarm in a way they're foraging they're going out and they're grabbing nectar and bringing pollen as well and they're bringing that and feeding the swarm and especially if the swarm's out there for um, more than just a day, um, you see more foraging activity. So you can't put them in. A, you cannot take a swarm and put it in a closed-up ventilated box and expect them to last days in there. Um, they will burn through it. Bees eat, eat, eat. Just remember, when you're one frame short, you can fit more honey. Oh, yeah, and then someone's got to cut it out and squeeze it, and you got comb going all over the place. You can fit more honey, I guess, if you space it out, but I see, I see. Let's see here. Hey, Shane, I answered. I actually answered your question earlier. Maybe you, you ducked out for a minute, but, yeah, you can. obviously you can jump out and participate in our chat and make fun of people just like I do, um, but... Um, maybe look into what Ian Stepler did for his wife. Um, she was bad allergic and she went through some therapy. Um, they, they have for it to get over that and build back a tolerance to it. I don't know a whole lot of details, but I know Ian said that worked really good. I've known other beekeepers that have had that done. Um, and, and maybe it's a possibility, um, that that could work out again. I'm just, I hate to hear that. That would be awful. All right. My area is headed into a dearth period. I've got five to seven hives that are new splits that I have made in the last one to two months, and they are all starting to show signs of European fowl brood. What would be the best way to go? Ooh, okay. Well, one of the problems with European fowl brood is it's in the the, the bee system. It's in the food, too. 
So you got to get that out of their system. So if you can, if they're strong enough, if they're, you know, if they're not super weak, you can shake them onto foundation, some good foundations with some good, good, a good coat. And you can give them drawn combs too, if you have that from something else, but it's still best to feed them, flush that out of their system. If you have a little bit of Hive Alive or a Thiamol product, put that in there, purge that out of their system. And if you can store those combs in a freezer or something, that would help. And what you're also doing is you're eliminating any of the affected, infected brood. Um, your population will take a hit. Um, but this, even though your population will take a hit because you'll lose all that brood and all that kind of stuff, this will clean them up. And it also gives you an opportunity to do an oxalic acid vapor treatment and or some type of treatment and all of your mites are killed or the majority of them are killed and that could clean that up i don't it's hard for me to make recommendations based off of what i can't see um, on the size of the colony and the conditions and your options but I'm, there's a couple options there for you um, there also is some products like teramycin that can help if you can get a vet to sign off on that i've never used antibiotics before so I've heard that they'll work. I've just I can't speak from experience. Ooh, okay. I used a queen excluder between the bottom and the hive body for a week, then remove. I've had good luck doing this. So this is for identifying where the queens are at. Um, typically, that's um, commercial guys will use this too if they're requeening or if they're trying to shake bees or make splits or whatever you know they'll send a crew of guys in there they'll throw some excluders in between or what they'll do is and this this is what they'll do a lot as well if they're wanting to pull a split they'll go in and let's say it's a double d hive. you got 40 double d hives and you're wanting to just break the operation down in half what they'll do is they'll go through the day before or the morning and you'll pull everything you want out of the bottom box or the top box for your split. If it's this many frames of fruit, food, these particular frames of brood, whatever, and you take that and you, then you put those in the top box above the excluder. So the excluder's in the middle. What you want to leave stays at the bottom. What you want to take stays at the top. The trick is if you don't find the queen, then you have to shake all of the bees at the entrance so they can... Um, crawl up back into the entrance if your hive's close to the ground or shake them just down to the bottom box and then put the excluder on and then leave that and then you can come back later that evening and all of the bee the nurse bees that you want will go back into that top box and then you can pull your split and if you take it to a new location you'll keep all the forager bees too so excluders can be used for yes a lot of things not not just honey production but for making splits isolating where the queen's at I really like queen excluders quite a bit. So old McNally's honey. Um, this is the guy that maybe in some of our videos you've seen the wooden uh, queen grafting setup that we have, and um, he makes um, those. And so he's been on a road trip. He's that's yeah. Multiple times you've mentioned you've been on a road trip and listening to us, and um, that's pretty cool. Um, it's it's neat to be with people on their road trips. Um, they need they should have had this when I was truck driving. Um, yeah. Hmm. That would have been fun. Talk bees. Let's see here. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Historically, very allergic to honeybee venom, but three years in, the reaction has finally diminished to the sting and, and light localized swelling. It's really strange. Um, there's a lot that goes on with reactions. Um, I've heard people who have been put on medication or have had surgeries have all of a sudden had reactions where they never have had before. Um, I've, there's been people I've known that have been beekeeping for 30 years and then develop a reaction. And there's some folks that um, had really bad reactions the first couple times and then got over it and they were fine. It, it, I, I think there's a, there's a whole lot of body chemistry, of course, at play that we don't understand. But um, there are some therapies out there now, and they say that they have really high success rates with those, like very high success, success rates with those. So I, I, I'll have to ask Ian about that and see. That would be cool. It would, that would be a neat, neat.
neat thing to learn more about. Are you going to sell queens this year? And if you do, how do I order them? So, hey, Chris, um, we typically don't sell a lot of queens anymore. Just we're so busy with so many other branches of uh, the business. And um, yeah, just we just don't do queens. And there's It's not the most profitable thing either, especially if you don't have crews of people to help. Um, I think you can be profitable just as a, a couple people, one or two people. But you have to really just focus on queens at that point. So... If I, when I do sell queens anymore, it's pickup only, and that's a we just don't ship queens, and it's it's hardly worth it to again, because I don't have any employees. So if someone wants one queen, then I've got to go get that queen, put it in a cage, then I have to you know, prep a shipping container that's just right, then take it to the post office, and do that. And by the time I do that, I mean honestly, it's I'd have to charge a lot per queen to make that worth my time. And, you know, I just, I'm not charging 50 bucks a queen, so. Oh, yeah. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah, yeah, I see you, Chris. The combs that have European foul print on them after I take them out of the hive. Am I able to use them later, or will I just need to get rid of them completely? Working on a small budget, if I'm able to get, would be ideal. I use them later, um... I don't know what the details are on that, but I've had a European foul brood in the, the past. I have never burned combs for European foul brood. Um, I have, again, I've never used antibiotics. Um, letting them be frozen for a while, um, that helps. Letting them sit for a long time, um, it helps. And I don't think that the spores can survive long periods of time just sitting there. I need to look into this a little bit more. I've known this at one point, but I, I cannot remember all the details. But yes, you can reuse those. And some people, I've seen got people burn their hives down for, for European foul brood, thinking that's the only way to fix it. No, please don't do that. A good queen with good genetics and a little bit of a boost can help. So if the colony's a little bit weak and you can get a queen with better genetics and give them you know flush some feed through them that can help out and that's something that you know we select for i mean we just have a zero tolerance policy and some of the queens that i purchased um to bring into our genetic lines years ago and it and really bolstered them up and it made a lot of sense and i, I think was a good move is i purchased some queens from michael palmer and michael is in you know vermont they deal with a lot of cold weather and, and rough long conditions and so chalk brood um, Nozema, different things that aren't as big of a deal in the south. They're they're more of a concern up north, and so you know he he has a really I think respectable way of um, you know selecting for bees, and so I brought some of those in, and I still purchase from Michael on occasion um, to bring some of those back in to keep some of the genetics fresh because I still you know I open you know made our queens and we have our lines too, and so. We bring those in to keep things fresh, and um, I, I've really been pleased with the bees that I've gotten from him. Let's see here. Mm -mm -mm. Dear, near Nashville, got a, got a new late spring that's now a full deep. After nectar flow, should I put on another deep over the summer to get the hive as full as possible before going into fall and winter? Uh, good question, Brad. So you've got a new late spring that's now a full deep. Um if you don't have any honey supers on it, I would go ahead and throw one on now. Um, ideally, I think it's best to try to, to get colonies to two deep boxes. If you can feed them and get them to three deep boxes, I say go for it. Um, you do pay more for the sugar to get them to feed, but they're, they're drawing combs and they draw a second box really good. And when that, that second box is about three quarters of the way drawn, just go ahead and pull up a frame of brood into a third box and do the same thing. And having combs is really valuable because if you need to make a split, um, if you want to make a split, or if you just need to do anything, um, having combs allows you to be able to do so much more and a lot faster and it helps your bees do things a lot faster. And so, yeah, um, I think it's best to overwinter with double deeps because... That means the colony's strong, but I've overwintered with singles, and I've overwintered with five-frame nukes in Tennessee as well. A lot of it is more about the condition of the bees.
be well. We don't have European foul brood in New Zealand, but we do have American foul brood. We have a burn policy for this. Do you use antibiotics in the U.S. for American foul brood? So that really depends on location. Tennessee is a burn state, and several states are. And there are several states that aren't. And so in Tennessee, yeah, if you have American foul brood, you burn it to the ground. And as contagious as it is and devastating as American foul brood is, that actually makes a lot of sense to me. Um, some people don't like the thought of it, but the the vaccinations sound expensive and not fully you know, 100% guaranteed. And the the antibiotics are like trying to put a Band-Aid on an artery wound. It's, it's just, it's not going to long-term fix anything. It's just not going to work. So you might as well burn it. It's not worth it. If you have one colony in a yard of 40 and you can prevent the other 39 from getting it by eliminating that one, totally worth it. And I've never heard of anybody cleaning it up and getting it to stay clean you have to keep treating it and keep treating it and it's just not worth it i think it only takes like 13 spores or something like that to contaminate a hive maybe it was 30 spores but it was massively low and one infected um brood can contain over a million spores massively contagious and, and you probably know this be well but you don't have european foul brood that is awesome I'm jealous. All right. Hmm. All right. It, it, we're getting to, um, I told everybody, hour and a half. Chris has got stuff to do. We've got a lot to do. I've still got the honey to deal with. Um, I want to do a little summary at the end. Um, just kind of let you know what we're doing right now because in the YouTube videos, you get to see like little snippets. And honestly, I haven't been able to do near as much videos as I have in the past, and I apologize for that. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and I can't explain it all. But um, we definitely plan to do a lot more in the future, have some good things in the work. It just takes time to build an infrastructure and all that kinds of stuff. But um, we're really excited about the future and what we'll be able to do. But right now, what we're experiencing is the last vestiges of the flow. We're seeing a lot of sweet clover, and... I've never seen it bloom so good. Usually it's pretty sporadic, but I'm seeing more of it than than usual. And I think we're getting some from Sumac. I don't know. So my hope is in a video upcoming, I've got some honey that I've really separated out to be able to see what this last 10 to 14 days of nectar actually is. And I'm going to send that off to a lab and they will analyze that and break it down percentage wise on what it is. So that'll be really fun. Um, for me to learn and, and maybe you guys can get something useful out of it the nectar we have right now is extremely strong smelling you can smell it a couple dozen feet away from the hive the wind is blowing towards you it's super strong you open up a hive and it's just awesome awesome and floral great flavor so i'd love to know um, we are pulling the honey supers off using a fume board i'm using honey bandit and you can make your own fume boards you can just use a lid Put a little bit of felt underneath it, you know, something like that that'll just wick it a little bit and just spritz Honey Bandit or something like that underneath that. And you can have a couple of them. You can just put it on top. It'll drive the bees down, and it doesn't take a ton of the product. Mainly focus just a little bit in the center. Put a couple splits, spritz in the center and then put the majority of the outer edges of it because that's where you have the biggest problem driving the bees is from the edges of the boxes. And then it really saves you a lot of time um, pulling those honey supers, especially if there's a dearth going on. You want the speediness of having that going on. But if you can do it before the end of your honey flow, then the bees aren't trying to rob the supers out. And you can just load the truck up or whatever you're putting it on, and it's not a problem at all. It was great. You know, we threw... 2,000 something pounds of honey onto the back of the truck and what we had is on the front half of the truck on the flatbed we had boxes of deep foundations with a frame feeder so we took them all the way down to the single deep took the excluder off pulled one frame of brood up into that second deep box and then since there's a little flow going on right now we didn't feed today which is awesome um, there's a there's a good bit of flow coming in, but we're watching it closely. And I imagine 
once they start drawing that up, I imagine they're probably drawing it right now. I saw bees with wax scales on them. So I'm pretty excited at how much new combs I'm probably going to get out of this. And so we're going to be feeding those hard. That honey goes on to the, the back part of the flatbed, and we strap that down. There's no bees robbing it at all, so we can be really relaxed bringing it here to the honey house, dropping those. And now we're running a dehumidifier and a fan, and that'll get our nectar, um, any, any nectar they threw in the last day or two, to make sure that it's down. I haven't tested mine, but a friend of mine tested their honey. It's been a very dry year in Tennessee this year. It was like 16.5 or something like that. Ideally, or maybe it was lower than that. It was like low 16s or upper 15s. It was stupid dry um, for Tennessee. We're, usually, we're fairly humid. We get a lot of spring rains. Um, typically, you're going to see your honey somewhere in the 17 range in my area. 17.2 in a dry year you might get upper 16 point something in a wet year you might get something like 18.2 and that's where i'm getting a little concerned if it's 17 something or lower i'm like all right let's extract um, if we have something that's 18 i like to dry it out just a little bit bring it into the 17s um, I, I think that it's a better honey and i don't have to worry about it getting just a little humid and and maybe fermenting or something like that um I, I i like my honey in 17 percent. good to see you mr vanderpool i hope things are good going good for you up there in um, oregon i know you guys are busy this time of the year we're trying to keep up with everything um i was thinking of you today while i was working in that ford truck um boy i love that thing i loaded uh, all that honey on the back and all the other equipment and that dually didn't even act like it had a load on the back. It was awesome. Very nice. And since it wasn't my Chevy, um, my 83, I wasn't riding like this the whole way through the field. Which, you know, when you're 150 pounds in a truck that big, uh, yeah, you get thrown around quite a bit. So anyways, we're busy this time of the year. We're going to start mite treatment soon. I'll try to get as many videos as I can done. Um, we've kind of changed some things up, which is part of the reason it's been harder to get videos out um, as Jimmy now has gotten older but you know both kids are homeschooling quite aggressively um, we don't take summer off for school um, we do it a little bit lighter this time of the year but you know school's always in session baby um, you're always learning something I hope and uh, so Laurel's not out in the field to like take the videos a lot of times anyways we're gonna be doing another live chat soon um, let's go ahead and kind of plan something out so you guys can all prepare for that if you'd like to be on. Let's see. So today is what, Chris? It's the 17th of June. All right. So maybe go for like, uh, what about a Friday night? What about like the 30th or something, Chris? We've never done Friday night before. Let's try that out. At least not, not that I remember. So the 30th, which is a Friday, we'll be doing another live chat, probably about an hour and a half. Got any crazy questions between now and then, we'll see you there. Thanks for hopping on, everybody. God bless. Happy beekeeping.